from the standpoint of the user, it feels like the force. Geeksvana is your drone channel. Devon Island is the largest uninhabited island on Earth. Located in the High Arctic, it is often referred to as Mars on Earth. The Horton Crater is considered one of the Earth's best analogue sites for Mars and the Moon. It is here that the Horton Mars Project, an international multidisciplinary field research project dedicated to advancing planetary science and exploration, find themselves on the cutting edge of drone technology and development, looking to make drones an essential part of a future manned mission to Mars. Today, I am joined by the director of the Horton Mars Project to discuss how drones are to become a key element of space exploration, including the caves on the Moon and Mars, as well as the astronaut Smart Glove, designed to aid human-machine interface when controlling drones on Mars. Dr. Pascal Lee is the founder and chairman of the Mars Institute, director of the NASA Horton Mars Project, and senior planetary scientist with the SETI Institute. He very kindly joined me for a chat about his work. The Helton Mars Project is actually a privately run project. Wow. Uh, we, we have contracts from NASA and occasionally from the Canadian Space Agency, even from ESA. Uh, but the, the, the upshot of it is that it's a private effort. And this is why it's actually um, uh, uh, interesting, I think, because we are able to test things that are, you know, not quite fundable by government grant. Absolutely, yes. Up front, at least. Uh, and, and, you know, let our imagination run loose. And that, that's how you, you end up with, with uh, some projects like these. The fact that this, this is a, a project working towards Mars, I suppose it makes sense that it shouldn't be in the hands of any one government or any one organization. Um, and, it, of course, it, it gives you that, that freedom as well. The, the beauty about working uh, in the space program is that we, we, we tend to have a, a relatively uh, open mind in terms of viewing this as, as humanity's effort to, to reach for, for other, other worlds. Uh, the space arena is really very cooperative. Uh, it, 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 you know, it's held back because of, of sometimes technology needs to be protected. Um, but otherwise, in terms of just being a, an open forum for ideas and and things that we can share with with other agencies it's it's actually a very it's, it's a good field of research to work in moving on to the world of drones <laughs> um you and your colleagues yeah. have obviously just carried out the first field test of the human machine interface um uh, with the space the spacesuit glove and augmented reality display um how how did that go can you can you talk me through that yeah so so you you, you should we should go back to the motivation of this first yes. right because when you are in a spacesuit, first of all, spacesuit, uh, as as most people know, but it's worth repeating, it is not just clothing. It's it's a wearable spacecraft. It's a very complex piece of machinery, uh, and therefore it's heavy. Of course. Uh, and so, uh, the, a spacesuit typically weighs about three hundred pounds. So that's about one hundred and fifty kilograms. Obviously. We, if, if you try on a spacesuit here on Earth, you, you can barely walk with it. Indeed. Uh, thankfully, we don't need one to, to walk around. Once you take a spacesuit that's, that weighs 300 pounds here on Earth to the moon, where gravity is six times less than on the Earth, uh, your spacesuit has a felt weight of 300 pounds divided by six. That's just 50 pounds. So now you have something that's akin to a heavy backpack. Uh, and that is why the Apollo program was even possible. The, the Apollo astronauts wore spacesuits that weighed about 290 pounds. Wow. Uh, uh, but they were still able to hop around on the moon because they were in lunar gravity. Uh, if you go to Mars, uh, where, of course, we ultimately want to go to look for life and, and do things, uh, gravity on Mars is, is higher than on the moon. It's, it's actually 38% of what it is on Earth as opposed to 17%. Which is what right. Okay. Okay. Um, on Mars, uh, a 300 pound spacesuit would have a felt weight of about 125 pounds. That is way too heavy uh, for you to be a nimble explorer. So, Absolutely. so uh, we are working on reducing the mass of the spacesuit. And that is the core reason why we even have a spacesuit up there on Devon Island. We, we are working on ways to reduce its mass. Right. And the good news there is that we, we think we have uh, approaches that will uh, result in a in an actual suit that will have a 
a true weight on Mars on, on Earth of about 150 pounds. Wow. And a felt weight on Mars uh, of about 40 to 50 pounds. You're chasing the the 50 percent weight, uh, which which must right. be right. very very difficult. Exactly. Because as you as you point out, the the, the it's very difficult because the spacesuit is already such a lean and mean uh, spacecraft. Yes, <laughs> bare bones minimum. Uh, it has, you know, you you are s surrounded by cocoon, uh, by form fitting atmosphere, uh, and then you you st you do need waste disposal. You need life support. You need uh, communications. You need uh, computers on board. So so you you have really a minimal spacecraft already, and the challenge is to bring the mass of that thing down by half. So part of the overall strategy actually is to offload from the spacesuit things that you could carry, for example, on a on a rover that remains in proximity to you. Okay. So, for example, the heavy uh, 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 oxygen tanks uh, or the heavy batteries that you have inside your backpack, those are things that you can keep in the backpack in smaller forms and then keep the bulk of the reserves on, a, on an ATV, for example, on, on that right. four-wheel yes. bike that you would drive around. And so the, the idea here now is to have a spacesuit that has only a very small oxygen tank or a small battery pack, but but now the your reserves are on an ATV on a on a rover that That's you ride. Clear. Then that ATV is a smart vehicle. It follows you. It's it's a it's a dry, it's a self driving ATV. Fantastic. And so what what becomes the human exploration um, unit is no longer the astronaut and his or her spacesuit, but the astronaut, the spacesuit, and his or her ATV. Yeah. You have essentially a, a carrier or a Sherpa, yeah, so yeah. No, indeed, indeed. carrying your reserves, uh, you know, with you, uh, and and now you're much more able to 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 work. But of course, you have to make sure that you remain in close proximity to your reserves. Of course, yes. Right now. I, I noticed in the, in the test video um, the, 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 there was the concept of the fetch was being tested as right. well, so that the, right. the drone could go to that ATV. Perhaps if you're in a hole or something, and you think, okay, I need this piece of equipment, and it's on the yes. ATV. Uh, you know, you, you, you might you might need a hook uh, or an anchor. Or you, yes. I mean, something that a drone could manage, obviously, is, is and that's still very vaguely defined, uh, but. You know, you might need an oxygen cartridge uh, for, for for some reason. You might need, um, you know, a, I don't know, a, 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 an optical device. I mean, it's something that you that, that would be available for you to, to sort of pick up as a tool. Absolutely. From, from your vehicle, which but, again saves having to carry it the, the entire time because it, it can sit, as you say, it can sit on the ATV, thus bringing the weight down of your. Of, of your of your, your your personal payload down so that you can move around more exactly so so the premise of of your exploration environment right now is you you are in a space you okay it's lightweight it's lighter in weight but you are very close to an atv that's your mobile local mobile platform and uh you dealt with the weight issue of the suit but you're still not done with the rigidity of it because you still need to be in a pressurized suit the course. no atmosphere to speak of on the moon there is barely an atmosphere on mars i mean there is a substantial atmosphere on mars but from the standpoint of of providing uh, adequate pressure to keep you alive uh you know you, you you don't have that on mars the atmospheric pressure is about 10 millibars so that's what you ha would have on the Earth at an altitude of about a hundred and a hundred thousand feet. Wow. Okay. And the other day, when uh, Felix Baumgartner, for example, jumped from the stratosphere, yes, during the Red Bull Challenge, he was at about a hundred and twenty thousand feet. So he was at Martian surface pressure. He, of course, had to wear a spacesuit, which is what he had. Um, uh, and so the point here is that at those altitudes, you have to have a spacesuit, and therefore at the surface of Mars, you have to have a certain spacesuit at all times. And the problem with the spacesuit is that it, it well, the benefit of the spacesuit, but it's also a problem, uh, is that it its function is to surround you with a cocoon of atmospheric pressure. Okay. Uh, and of course, it has to provide you with air that you can breathe as well, oxygen, uh, but it has to provide you provide your body with a pressurized environment 
And uh, that means that your spacesuit will become taut and stiff, like a balloon or a basketball is stiff. Yes, or of course. Soccer ball uh, when it's inflated. Uh, and so, so the stiffness is very hard to overcome. And this is why astronauts have such difficulty moving their fingers and their arms. If you, if you try to bend your arm towards yourself, uh, it tends to want to recoil back into some neutral position. Uh, same thing with the fingers. If you, if you try to tighten your grip, uh, the tendency, of course, is if you let go, is, is you know your, your fingers bound back to this rest position, and and therefore it's it's a real it's a real task to to do things in space. Astronauts who go about repairing satellites or space station parts. Uh, have tools that are designed to require minimal finger pressure and okay that makes complete uh, sense our motions uh, but you can see that uh, if you really want to be a, a fully well equipped explorer on a place like mars you want to have drones you want to have something that will give you the aerial perspective if you absolutely want that on the moon as well and how on earth are you going to fly one of these drones if we stay with the interfaces that we have today I see a wall behind you there of yes control which, which wouldn't be much use in on Mars, would they? Because they're so intricate. I'm, of course. I'm, I'm thinking that as as cutting edge as this wall of controllers looks, it will one day uh, feel like it's part of a, a museum of ancient interfaces. Absolutely, because what we really want is something that will not take up first of all both hands of the astronaut. Uh, but second, nothing that's going to require joysticking, you know, at the, you know, and, and requiring finger pin pinching to, 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 to hold the, the joysticks. Yes. Uh, and, and then of course you, you don't want to have an astronaut have to stare down at a screen. No, of course while not. While the problem is, is up ahead. Uh, you want to really streamline all of this into something that's a lot more, uh, physically easy to do. And also intuitive and less prone to, to, you know, to, to error, less susceptible to error. So there's this company uh, called Intention. It's like the word intention, but without the I, it's just intention. Uh, this is starting clever. with an N. And Intention is this startup uh, that was started up by students, in uh, engineering students at NTNU, the Norwegian wow. um, uh, technology. Uh, University of, of sorry, the NT, NTSU, the Norwegian Technology and Science University in Trondheim in Norway. And it's essentially the uh, MIT of, of Norway uh, where they have really some, some very bright engineering students. And they started, started this company on their own on the side wow. called Intention. Uh, and they've designed this glove as one of their first intuitive interfaces. To, to not just fly drones, which is what they advertise, of course, but also to, to play music. So by waving your hand and Fantastic. your fingers, you, you actually can, can just play music. Wow. In a very physical and you know, intuitive way. So it's a very creative group of people. Yes. Uh, blending art, aesthetics, ergonomics, and, and sort of uh, engineering uh, that came up with this glove that allows you to fly drones. And by chance, I, I was attending this conference in Oslo a few months ago, and I ran into this booth uh, where these students were, and they demonstrated how their glove could fly a drone. And th this is when oh, <laughs> <laughs> all lights, all light bulbs in my head. Yes, up. I can imagine. Because this was the solution that we were looking for. This is the this is the answer to to the problem. Yes, because to, to not even have to do much with your fingers at all, and, and yes. it, it is you, literally the movement of the hand, which is that's just so incredible. Right. Which is still a movement uh, you can do even in the suit. It's still both. It's the movements of the hand, the movements of the wrist, the movements of the fingers a little bit. But the beauty of it is that you can really adjust the sensitivity of your glove. To make to, to enable a motion with very small finger motions, 
So therefore, of course, when you are in drone mode, so to speak, you have to be very careful what you do with your fingers. Of course. <laughs> uh, but just let go of your hand and come back to some neutral position. The, the drone will essentially station keep okay. and, and not, not do anything or land itself safely, you know, and, and wait for further instructions. So, so it has some very good um, uh, safeguard modes. Uh, but th this, this glove was essentially a... <laughs> I, like I said, the first thought that came to my mind was Arthur C. Clarke's third law, um, which which basically says any technology that's sufficiently advanced is indistinguishable from magic. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, here you were just wearing this glove and making a drone do whatever you wanted to do by just uh, waving your hand. And uh, the, the other thing that came to mind, of course, was the fact that... Um, uh, you know, this was essentially akin to the force. This is just looks so instantaneous, which of course you're going yeah. to need because um, every second will count when they're out when they're outside of the um, um, the mission bases. Um, it just it, ab absolutely incredible. The coding must be um, beautiful. Right. So, so, so the you're correct. The the core, you know, the original core of the technology has been around for quite some time. You know, I, I, we've had some comments from people. Well, the, you know, didn't Atari or Nintendo <laughs> do that already? Yes, they, they. There is some aspect of that that has been around, but the the challenge here is to precisely do some very uh, sensitive motions, uh, still effect change on your aircraft, and of course, do that in real time with a lot of with with fast computing uh, happening as well. Of course. Uh, so, so it's a it's it's a highly mature state, I would say, of things that have been around and brewing for for quite some time. In the video, was was that Brandon Dotson who was carrying out the testing? Yes. So, to to do the test in a way that was as quantitative as possible, and also uh, done by you know someone who has some real experience doing flight testing. We, we involved Brandon Dobson. So Brandon actually was, uh, so on our project in the Arctic, uh, the, the Health and Mars project, we, we now have a new uh, fellowship. Uh, so far, we haven't been able to form more than one per year, but since we're private, if you have donors uh, you know, who are listening, they, they feel free to contact us. <laughs> but we've created uh, this, for, this year, actually, in 1990, 2019, for the first time, something we call the HMP, the Health and Mars Project, Apollo Fellowship. And that's to celebrate the 50th anniversary, of course, of, our, of the first moon landing. Fantastic. Uh, and the uh, HMP, the first HMP Apollo Fellow was offered to, to Brandon. So Brandon has an incredible background. He's, a, he's now a test pilot in the U.S. Army on helicopters. Wow. Uh, but he studied physics at Caltech. He, he has a a degree in aerospace engineering from Georgia Tech. He, he's worked on propulsion, um, but also on, uh, you know, with the astronaut office as an intern. So he had a, he had a really good uh, background yes. in, first of all, in, in physics, engineering, and very uh, impressive space flight, but also uh, as a, as a, as a test pilot of rotorcraft. And so, uh, uh, Plus, he had an interest in drones. So, so anyway, he was the perfect candidate to be our f official test pilot. Uh, several others went through the suit and, and tried on the glove. But Brandon was sort of our, our um, metric, if you will, our standard. And so he went through um, the, an entire field flight test program, essentially, of, of using the glove, not just in, in specific functions, such as fetching something or exploring a cliff or uh, sampling a patch of grass. But uh, he went through uh, some exercises of precision landing, for example, and mm -hmm. accuracy of flight by using just this glove versus using the, the controller. And uh, I think the, the gist of the answer is uh, it's a lot easier, faster, and more precise to use the glove than to use the controller that we're used to. The actual motions of the of the drone, the pitch, the yaw, the rolling, and the thrusting up and down, was was done with the glove, 
but the gimbling of the camera on the drone was was tied to head motions and to a VR uh, augmented reality display. Now, uh, as it turns out, we use a relatively simple drone that had a one-dimensional gimbal for its camera. Yes. But you can easily imagine doing that with a multi-directional uh, Indeed. gimbal. Indeed. Indeed. In case any motion of your head inside the the helmet, not just the up and down, would would translate into so so you would essentially be, you know, flying your drone and then, you know, looking around. This this point of view flying is is of course uh, already commonly used, but it's just makes it very intuitive to to have it uh, set up this way amazingly so um, yes amazingly so because because it, I, I, I just feel like it's it's almost freeing is 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 how i felt when i was watching the testing because you've got this chap in a spacesuit which as you say is very confining and if something's going on around you you know you are very much in it in a, in a, on, a, on a hostile planet and if something's going on around you you'd want to know what's going on i, I could only imagine the amount of freedom and peace of mind it will give you that you can just launch a drone and check out what's going on over there and you know then then head over there or not depending if you've if you've assessed it to be safe I think. the uh, interface itself you know the the vr goggles we, we're unlikely to keep the goggles in the spacesuit ultimately we, we okay. think that what we will have is, is some sort of a head-up display a heads-up display inside the helmet visor uh the, the general idea of uh i mean the spacesuit that we have uh, traditionally uh, you know, used in space uh, is, is very averse to electronics inside the spacesuit because you're in a pure oxygen environment. Even though you try to remain below the flame point, you, you know, it, it's sort of not a good idea to have electronics of course. With, with pure oxygen around it. I mean, any little spark will turn into smoke and... It'll be just bad news. Yes, uh, so bad news. so there's a general reluctance to have ele- a lot of electronics inside, you know, like a projector of of display. You know, of, of data. What we think we will have is a way of of displaying the data on the visor itself, as opposed to having the astral wear glasses. And, yes. You know, what what if those get knocked off site? You know, off yes, of course, at an angle. Of, of course. And, then, and now you're are your your vision is blocked because you can't really reach for your face uh you know so so we don't want glasses i think uh but yes. these are these are details that will get worked out you know over time expect it to be a payload heavy drone or would you expect it to be a drone which is much more um uh um see, seeking out locations etc uh, on, on on scouting missions something like that can stay up there for a for a, for a longer period uh you bring you bring up an interesting so first of all uh, drones are revolutionizing how we even study the earth. Uh, of course, you know, most of us use drones for, for entertainment, for fun, for, yes. for, you know, for interesting filming. Uh, but the truth is in, in geology, for example, w- w- which is what I do mostly, uh, drones are a revolution because, you know, in geology, when you do field geology, everything is about context, and you you want to not just pick up a rock, but understand the whole mountain behind the rock, uh, and where it comes from, and if there's a mountain chain behind that, you know. So, you, so everything is about context in geology. And drones, before, in order for you to have geological context for anything, you needed to you know charter a very expensive helicopter, and uh, you know, uh, that's why geology was. Uh, you know, you know, ex- exploration geology can be very expensive because yes. of that. Uh, but now drones are allowing field geologists to just do their own remote sensing at, at sort of from aer- alt- alt- altitudes, uh, and it, it's it's really revolutionizing how we do field science. And it's true in biology and in other fields as well uh, of, of sort of studies of the earth. But um, uh, therefore, we anticipate needing this kind of, of of craft to help us explore, you know, places that we want to survey and, and understand the the geology of the Moon, Mars, Titan, uh, Titan, which is this large moon of of Saturn, which has a thick atmosphere. Mm-hmm. It's made of nitrogen. Actually, it has a two bar atmosphere. So, wow. in fact, you. You, you can fly a lot easier on Titan than on the Earth. Plus, gravity is less on Titan. So, so you know, it's it's a it's it's a wonderland for flying drones. Indeed. <laughs> uh, but 
but the thing about about Titan, of course, is that it's it's a moon of Saturn. It's so far away from it that, that there's no way for you to remote control a drone. Uh, the, the, you know, light time signals would take over uh, an hour to get there, uh, and so you know you, you, you crash your drone before you even knew it. Uh, so so you'd have to uh, you you have to rely on a robot drone to do the work. And so if you're going to bother to go to, to Saturn at all, you're going to want to pack that robot with instruments so that it becomes really a low altitude remote sensing platform. And so that's why the Dragonfly drone is moving in the direction of a lot of autonomy, no human intervention during the flight. Okay. Uh, but of course it will do a few stops. And once it pauses, maybe we can talk to it and download some data, but otherwise it's just doing its own thing. And the data acquisition during the flight is all automated. And of course, it will carry as many instruments as it can lift, uh, you know, to 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 be a Indeed. productive mission. But the but where humans are able to go, the moon in the short term, Mars down the road, and maybe beyond. Uh, you want a drone that is probably going to be less burdened by sophisticated payloads, uh, but just carry some basic remote sensing recon tool uh, that you can, you know, you can use easily. So you don't want some sort of a delicate instrument on board, like a, I don't know, an infrared remote sensing uh, camera, although they can actually be quite robust these days. Uh, you, you just want some basic payload on that drone. And what that is, is, is still to be determined. In fact, that's part of what we are studying on Devon Island. We, we want to understand, you know, where do you draw the line between wanting something that a drone would carry versus you know, yes. something that your rover would carry? Yes, um, indeed, indeed. You know, how often do you feel the need of flying this drone? Is it, you know, once per outing? Is it, you know, 10 times per outing? Is it mm. once in a blue moon? So, so these are things that we are still working. Because, of course, in addition to the drones that humans would operate themselves, there are the drones that would be robot drones that we would also have on Mars okay. that, that we could program to do their own thing as well. Wow, of course. Uh, so, but we should really view, this is something that's really, that didn't exist really in the sci-fi uh, imagination, you know, it's sort of the imagined world of how we would explore planets in the future, that astronauts would be assisted by drones. And you always showed astronauts being assisted maybe by robots on the ground, but not by drones. And I think flyers are really a very powerful tool uh, to, you know, to, to help you in exploration. Coming mission to Mars, Mars 2020, is taking a drone for the first wow. time. There'll be a little helicopter on this rover. The rover's launching next year. It's about the size of Curiosity. Uh, it doesn't have a name yet, uh, so we still call it Mars 2020, this rover. Fantastic. It will carry for the first time uh, an aerial vehicle to, to Mars. And it, it's not going to do much science, at least it's not uh, officially doing a lot of science. It's mainly an engineering test. And it's a drone that has uh, a single rotor mast, but yes. two sort of rotating rotors, sort of the, the common helicopter design. Uh, and this way you don't need a, you know, a tail rotor for torque or anything like that. Uh, and but of course, because the atmosphere of Mars is a hundred times less dense than the atmosphere of the Earth, you need rotors that are spinning roughly ten times faster. Because lift goes wow. as the square of your spin velocity, right? Of your of yes. your airfoil velocity. Um, so, to to generate lift, the same amount of lift with a hundred times less density of of air, you need to spin your rotors ten times faster. So we're talking about rotors that are spinning at over 3,000 RPMs wow. um, <laughs> to, to make this drone on Mars work. You, you kindly sent me another video showing um, your work with drones in the, uh, the LiDAR uh, side of things, yes. with the Astrobiotics um, uh, LiDAR-equipped drone, uh, which had the, um, the, the lava tube ice cave uh, 3D mapped for the first time. Yeah. That yeah, so, looks incredible. So that's that's related work, although it's sort of from a different end of yes. the, the, the story. Um, what we envision is that, well, first of all, we're fascinated by the fact that there are caves now identified on the moon and on Mars. There are caves. And these caves are, most of them, lava tubes. Okay, so, you know, 
just really quickly, when you have a lava flow going down some, some hillside, the, the lava flow will tend to cool off at the very surface first. And so you end up with a, a rigid top surface for the lava. But then the lava beneath this crusted top surface uh, is still very hot and flowing downhill. So you end up with this underground tunnel in which lava is flowing downhill that's roofed over by lava that has cooled off. And what happens often is that the lava from the source stops and the entire hot lava that's inside this tunnel gets drained out. And so you're left with this tube-shaped uh, underground tunnel that runs essentially, you know, uh, along the flanks of your volcano uh, that's roofed over, that's covered. And of course, over time with, with uh, instability and, and uh, fracturing, but also from impacts of at little asteroids and comets, you end up uh, having uh, specific, well, you end up having collapsed roof sections along okay. this, this underground tunnel. So yes. these are now access points to your underground cave. Fantastic. Now that's that makes the access very visible because you see a hole. In fact, that you have sometimes strings of holes that are along, you know, a line, and that's that tells you that there's a lava tube underneath. Uh, but of course, that means that their access is not that easy because you sort of have to go in from above uh, and then off to the sides to to explore the, the cave. Now, these caves on the moon and Mars are fascinating because once you're in one of these caves, you're no longer exposed to the uh, lethal radiation from space at the surface. Of course. Uh, stark day night temperature variations from micrometeorite impacts. You are in a shelter. You're in a natural shelter. And we're very interested in these caves on the moon and Mars because, first of all, uh, <clears throat> in the case of Mars, uh, they might actually be places that are a lot more hospitable to life. And so, is there life in these caves? especially because they're associated with volcanoes, which might still be active, even though they're not erupting. They, of course, they yes, dormant. yes. Now you have an underground environment that's protected from radiation, that's warm, that might have water in the form of vapor uh, condensing from the volcano inside the cave. You might have ice deposits. So the, the importance of these caves on Mars from the standpoint of your search for life there cannot be overstated. On the moon, uh, we have just reported last two years ago finding some caves. Well, first of all, we, we, we now know of about 300 caves on the moon. Uh, wow. Most of them at low latitudes. But at high latitudes, we, we found recently a few candidates uh, that we need to sort of confirm. But those are at such a high latitude on the moon, so near the lunar pole, that the North Pole, that sunlight never penetrates these caves and these caves right. are extremely cold in fact they are as cold as the surface of pluto uh, and so therefore they might trap ice as well that could be you know just just available for you to go chip away at and and use um so so the bottom line is we we need to explore these caves and the solutions that people come up with so far are not very satisfactory i mean you know uh, an all-terrain rover into the cave that's not very practical no. the, the, the floor of these caves is very rough and then the, some people are proposing to dangle from the top a robot down a wire essentially or wow. a cable we, we call those dangle bots okay uh, that sound like a good idea <laughs> first of all if you studied or explored some of these caves you, you you know the the edge of these skylights, these holes that give you access to the to the lava tube, typically are very unstable. They they have rocks that can fall onto you. You know if you of go course, down. Of course, of course. Uh, so that's not good. Uh, some people are suggesting landing a spacecraft directly into the pit, uh, to the floor of the cave. You know through that opening. Uh, well, that's not great because presumably you're going to stir up a lot of dust. Yeah, yeah, the disruption is. And alter the environment that you know you, you want to explore so we were thinking that drones might be one way of addressing this whole issue uh, it's sort of a touchless approach to to entering your cave and of course once you're in a cave you have no more solar power you're not 
there's no more calms with the earth. You, you, you know, so you, you can't stay in those caves for too long. They're no. so cold. Well, that, you know, your batteries will just run down and we cannot take nuclear power to the moon. So, so how do you do this? Well, the idea is to have a rover on the outside of the cave and it's carrying a drone and you dispatch the drone. The drone flies in, maps Fantastic. the cave. Yes. And then before it gets too cold and, you know, and to send back its data back to the earth, it flies back out via known uh, route, mm -hmm. connects with the lander again, dumps the data back to the earth, recharges, warms up, goes in for more. Of course, it can even then, recharge on, you know, the, on the rover, of course. Yes. In That's fact, we're thinking that it might, and of course, if you're on the moon, you can't, you cannot use rotors because there's no atmosphere to win. Yes. So what you're going to have are little gas thrusters, little so rocket engines, you know, so just go psh, 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 like this. Uh, and uh, the idea is that you might even be able to recharge the fuel for, for these, for these drones on the main rover as well. That's absolutely uh, fantastic. So, yeah, but now that will still stir up some dust, we think, because now you're still talking about little rocket engines, but at least you're not landing an entire spacecraft. No, uh, indeed. And, 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 and also what you find in there is going to be 98% as it was, which of course is, right. is, is, is part of what you want to find out. Once you've landed a spacecraft inside it, disrupted everything, it's no longer in the state that you wanted to assess. Um, yes. So no, I think, that, I think that's absolutely fantastic. You, you're not going to pollute the the environment either because you're going to use a, a, an inert gas, probably yes. argon, as your as your you know uh, thruster or sort of a cold gas uh, approach to this. Indeed, and, so, and, and as as your video uh, showed, uh, the investigation which you which which was obviously the first three D mapping of a of of of, of a lava tube cave uh, was over in minutes. So again, it is something that can happen, right. as you say, within right. the, the span of its fuel cell. Exactly. So we tested this concept. We, we went to Iceland. We found a lava tube. There's, there's only volcanoes in Iceland. There's nothing else. Uh, and uh, we found a lava tube with plenty of ice in it, which is, of course, sort of what we dream to find on the moon and, and on Mars. And we deployed a drone inside. In fact, we, we mapped the whole entrance area of the, of the lava tube and the first section. And then uh, we mapped the main chamber as well with a drone. And this is a drone that carried a LIDAR. And the whole design is, is credit to Astrobotic, which is another space startup. Um, uh, they are based in uh, Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. Okay. And Astrobotic actually uh, is one of the contenders that NASA is considering to send payloads, scientific payloads to the moon. Wow. Um, but in any case, uh, they, they are thinking ahead and they've designed this amazing uh, uh, LIDAR equipped drone uh, that allows you to essentially map your way as you go. So the big challenge with LIDAR is that it, it produces a huge amount of data and it's, of it's very hard to sort of translate into, into a 3D environment. Uh, people do this with cameras now. You, you sort of film your, your surroundings in 360 degrees and you can turn this into a model of your surrounding, but that's using visible imaging. For LIDAR, what you have to do is send a laser signal in one direction, capture the bounce back, process the distance uh, and the texture of the wall, et cetera, to, to figure out what you just saw and then do that in all directions. So that's a lot more labor intensive, Absolutely. data intensive. Yes. And the amazing thing that Astrobotic has accomplished is to, is to couple a drone with a LIDAR so that as the drone flies, it's creating in real time a 3D model inside a cave without yes. visible lighting wow. uh, of, of what it's, what's around it. So, so in this sequence in Iceland, the drone is essentially flying where it is discovering that it can go uh, to map uh, the cave. That's, so, that's incredible. So, so that that final um, overview in the video that, that that shows all of all of the um, uh, the cave's terrain that's mapped in real time. So, therefore, as you say, the the data used is so much less. And therefore, right. if if you're in on Mars, the, the amount of data to send back to the rover or well, to, into the it's Earth. the fast processing that's the, that's sort of the the secret. It's the fast part. It's called Fantastic. SLAM technology: simultaneous locating and mapping. And so if, you, if you're able to achieve SLAM 
uh, with the LIDAR, you're, you're in good shape for, for some real-time mapping. I noticed on, on one of your short videos on your, your own YouTube channel, uh, I think it was called the Iceland Teaser, there was a shot of you flying a drone yourself on a, on a pull-away shot. Do you, do, you fly oh, many, yeah, yeah. Do, you, do you fly drones yourself in your spare time? I'm not, not that I'm sure you get much spare time with your, with your many vocations. No, I, I do. I, I do. I, I love flying drones. Uh, I, I actually am a uh, pilot uh, of, of aircraft myself. I, I'm a helicopter flight instructor wow. in the U.S. So I, I actually love flying. And I, I flew rotorcraft, you know, before I knew how to fly a drone. Uh, but... Um, but it's a lot more affordable. Yes, to get indeed. Your, your air photos <laughs> and your your beauty shots. Indeed. Uh, and it's you're also less busy. You don't have to fly the air rotor the helicopter while you're taking a picture. One final question, which is a little bit more sci-fi than sci-fact. So I apologise because I know everything. Your life is surrounded by science facts. But um, I'm, I'm working on another video which surrounds the thought of just with the amount of drone technology which which we are hoping to send out over the next few decades. I can't help thinking that it may even be a drone which discovers alien life. Um, um, and again, I'm talking about the, the sci-fi alien life of an actual intelligent being, which of course um, um, is, is, is extremely unlikely um, and I'm off in the distant future. But if, 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 that did ha if that did happen, in your opinion, would it be better for man or machine to meet that intelligent life first? Well, you, you probably don't want humans to meet the life first, mainly because you are concerned about contamination in both directions. Of course. Uh, you know, you don't want to disrupt the life that you might find and kill it off before you had a chance to study it. Uh, and vice versa, you, you don't want to expose your astronauts to alien life <clears throat> if, uh, you know, if you have an option to, to do that, you know, via robot first. Yeah. So, so the robot creates a safety buffer, I would say, in both directions. Uh, that, that's the whole discussion topic of planetary protection, it's called. Okay, so, so we, we, we right. could even see a time where, where two robots meet each other, ideally, to, to tell each other what's behind each other's yes. curtains, as it were. Conceivably. Conceivably. <laughs> it's easier said than done, because the premise, of course, of this is that you can actually sterilize your own robot thoroughly. Of that's course. never done that's never done completely even when Vi the viking uh, landers were sent to mars to look for life and were sterilized at the cost of almost a billion dollars of uh, 1970s dollars um, they, they they just went there with a lower count of microbes on board not a zero count yes and so everything we've sent to mars uh, up to this day has carried anywhere from tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of microbes right piggybacking on on the spacecraft and they are actually surviving once they land on mars because they are probably hiding in the nooks and crannies inside the instruments inside the spacecraft and inside these spacecraft they, they are shielded from radiation to some extent uh and from ultraviolet light um, they might even be protected from the cold if they're near the you know of course that's a that's an incredible thought that there could already <laughs> there, there is already life there technically because because we put it there um, yeah and we we are we are we feel relatively justified to do that because or to allow that because we don't think that life there can metabolize without being in contact with liquid water and so yes. there's no water to be held so all the all these life forms that we've sent to mars on board the spacecraft are just going to be latent they are just going to sit there eventually they will die you know from from just deep space radiation which penetrates very deeply into everything but but um in the short term they're not going to colonize mars because they need liquid water to proliferate and, and metabolize um you you bring up a good point a drone uh, our little drones our friends the drones could be the first human interface to run into alien life and, you know, uh, that, that's actually really food for thought. I wouldn't be surprised if it happened inside a cave on Mars Indeed. as opposed to the very surface because the very surface is, is not very hospitable to, you know, anything no. that's, that yes. approaches organic chemistry. It's fascinating.
Okay, well, thank you so much for your time. Um, I, 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 I hugely appreciate it. I apologise for being so nervous. Um, I've, I've only done a you few. Have a great, you have a great show. You have a great channel. I'm following it. Thank and you. And I, I would recommend it to others. I think it's, it's – what I like is about your analyses is that they're very, uh, you know, objective uh, and you're not know, tied to any drone companies. You can find links to the amazing work Dr. Lee and his colleagues are carrying out towards exploring the cosmos in the description. I recommend in particular the video where Dr. Lee explains the Drake Equation, which is used to estimate the number of communicating civilizations in the cosmos. It is fascinating and explains the equation and its significance. I would like to thank Pascal Lee for his time. We're a small channel and his generosity and time and kindness means an awful lot. See you next time.